Welcome to Wellbeing Through Design. Today's guest is Dr. Sandra. Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith is an author, speaker, and board certified physician. She has an active medical practice in Alabama near Birmingham area. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry at the University of Georgia and graduated with honors from Meharry Medical College in Nashville. She has been an adjunct faculty member at Baker College and Davenport University in Michigan, teaching courses on health, nutrition, and disease progression. Dr. Sandra is a national and international media resource on mind, body, spirit connection, and has been featured in Women Today, Red Book, and First for Women magazine. She is author of award-winning books, such as Set Free to Live and Come Empty, and Sacred Rest. When she is not working, she is observing nature, being present in the moment, and paying attention to the sounds. So welcome, Sandra. Welcome to the Thanks show. Thanks for having me. So I am always curious to know, what motivates you? I mean, you are such an accomplished doctor. Doctors are busy to begin with. <laughs> then you have all these accomplishments. So tell us, what motivates you? I like seeing people transformed. So I love that process of taking somebody from where they're at to, where, to first see the possibilities and then leading them on the journey there. And, but not leading them like I'm like, from the mountaintop shouting down to them, oh, I've, I'm already up here, come catch up with me. <laughs> but to kind of get in there with them and let them see the inner workings of the day-to-day -to, -day to how to move from one point to another. So that's what makes me want to write. That's what keeps me up at night when I should be probably sleeping sometimes to you know, write out books and do courses. That's what gets me on the road to go speaking. Those are the things that really keep me motivated to do what I do. Transformation is the key. Uh, regardless of what change you're looking for. So tell us, what is well-being to you? I mean, you are a big proponent on sleep, so we'll definitely talk about that um, as we go along. But mm -hmm. what does well-being mean to you? Yes, for me, well-being really is that whole mind, body, spirit concept, because if I'm just looking at the physical or I'm just looking at the mental or just looking at the spiritual, I'm segmenting out who I am as a total person. And so well-being is when all three components are working together in harmony in a way that they are, they are allowing you to live your best life, to be at the highest level of your abilities because you're not lacking in any of the three. Great. Are you being well? Yes, I feel energized. That's how I know if I'm living in a state of well-being. Um, when, when I'm out of balance, so to speak, I don't like the word balance. I use more harmony or um, mm -hmm. not kind of in sync with what's true for where I'm at in the season. When I'm not in sync with that, then I find that I stay in a state of just fatigue. I'm always tired, always exhausted. You know, someone say, how are you doing? You're like, I'm busy, busy, busy. You know, <laughs> And so when I feel like that and I feel like I don't have that time to just sit and look at the birds and listen to the sounds outside. When I don't have room in my life for that, I'm not a good person. I'm not the best I can be. I'm stressed, I'm strained, I'm under pressure. And you know, that's not, that's what I know I've kind of stepped out of well-being. Like half of my family are doctors, so to speak. And I have seen their life up close and personal of how busy and involved um, their profession is. Being a doctor, how do you find time? You have to be intentional. You know, you, I always say you don't find time, you make time. <laughs> because uh -huh. there's no time to be found. It will get wasted up kind of in the, in the trenches somewhere <laughs> unless you're very intentional. You know, I, for a long time I used to say, well, I don't have time to go for a walk or I don't have time to call a friend and just connect. I don't have time for all these things. But I had time to sit and watch Netflix for three hours. You know, I had time to look on Facebook and go through everybody's posts of their grandkids and their graduations. You know, I had, I had time for things that I wasn't trying to make time for and really didn't necessarily need, but I didn't have time for the things that were actually going to help me be a better version of myself. Yeah, it, had, it really came back to being very intentional about making the time for some of these things. I actually 
you know, people put in a doctor's appointment on the calendar and, you know, most of them will, will do everything in their power to try to make it to that doctor's appointment. I actually put me time on the calendar. I schedule it in as if I was going to the doctor or any of the other kind of important appointment. And I keep that appointment to myself. I think that I'm worth being able to segment out some portions of my life to be able to just take care of me. That is, that is such a key. I totally agree. Making that me time a priority and non-negotiable are mm -hmm. so important. Tell us, how has your background uh, shaped the way you perceive well-being to what you pursue now? I think my background really kind of gave me the, the education around what health and wellness looks like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, medicine's very kind of single focus, particularly in the type of medicine I do, internal medicine. You're looking at what's the problem, diagnose it, treat it, you know, however that treatment looks. And honestly, in our culture now, it looks like throw a pill at it. You know, <laughs> it's kind of the first response. So that's not really what I see as wellness. I don't think every problem needs a, a pill to fix it. I think there's a large amount of issues that we deal with in our health and in our well-being. Really, that comes down to lifestyle changes, just kind of taking an honest look about where we may be falling in places and where we may need to kind of pick up, pick up what we're doing so that it's a little bit healthier um, lifestyle. And so that's kind of more where my focus is now. And, you know, I think traditional medicine is catching up with that, but that's not what's taught in our medical schools. I mean, let's be honest, it's still the same. This is the medical problem. This is the biochemistry behind it. These are the pills you give to treat it, and this is how it's done. But I think really as we progress that hopefully there'll be a transition in the medical field where we're seeing more focus on prevention and the lifestyle changes that are needed really to keep people in a state of health, wellness, rather than trying to figure out how to heal them when they're already broken. True. It's always catch up as far as I'm concerned. Healthcare is all about catch up. It's like when, when the ball is dropped, who is going to pick it up? Mm -hmm. Tell us, um, has, it trans has this understanding trickled down to your day-to-day -day practice? Because I practice as a doctor. So when you see patients, do you have two prescriptions? One is the traditional pill and one is something else? Yes, I practice medicine now for over 20 years. And honestly, when I first started, it was more along the lines of, here's the pill, see you in two weeks or one month or whatever the time frame was. Now, um, really over the past probably 10 years of that, it's been more about, do we need a pill or can we start with something else first? Because I think sometimes when you, you know, if it's a drastic situation, someone's blood pressure 200 over 110, that needs a pill. You know, we can't relax that down. But if someone's blood pressure is 140 over 80, maybe they need to cut the caffeine out of their diet. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to get better quality sleep. There's some other things we can do. And as a doctor, I always um, wondered myself going through cancer and the treatment, is mm -hmm. there something called a placebo effect with medicines and pills? Like people just already have something in mind, like, okay, the doctor was going to give me a pill and I'll be fixed. It's like, sometimes it's psychological. That's just my feeling. I think the placebo effect definitely is real. You know, there's plenty of studies that have shown that there is such a thing. So I think it's definitely real. The thing is, <clears throat> there's some medicines I feel that have become more of a crutch than really treatment. Mm -hmm. Like sleep aids, let's say, for example. Yes. There are occasions where you need a sleep aid. Let's say you have a, something tragic happen you know, a death in the family that's unsuspected, let's say car accident, all of a sudden your emotional, spiritual, everything systems just got wrecked, you know, so going to sleep, you go two, three days and you can't go to sleep and your doctor gives you a pill. No problem with that. You know, you, your system's gone through a shock. And so you need something to medically help you unwind. The problem is that is then if that pill that really should have just been a temporary fix, kind of a band-aid, to kind of help you kind of bridge the gap between where you want to be and where you want to go becomes your lifeline. Okay. <laughs> now, every sleep has to have that same pill. You never learn how to have healthy sleep habits. You, you know, it's, it's feeding a problem instead of really helping you fix kind of the underlying issue. Yep, totally agree. And a um, lot of people fall into that trap 
and that's why it's like a repeat cycle. It's like, mm -hmm. how many times do you need to see a doctor? A couple of times and you should be done. But over here, it's kind of become like a repetitive process and it's always something or the other. So mm -hmm. that made me ask you that question. In your, while you were studying or while you were growing up or even now when you see in the society, has well-being ever affected the way um, uh, you experience and work environment or study environment or uh, church environment? And has that ever helped you or kind of defeated the whole well-being idea? Yeah, I well, what came to mind when you said that was just thinking about some past work situations, I think that were not conducive to well-being. You know, I've been in some situations where the environment's toxic. You know, all the lights are like turned on to 100 watt blast. You know, <laughs> you, you sit down at your computer and it's like wall to wall blue lights everywhere you look. I've, I've been in situations, particularly in hospitals <laughs> where I see this, where it's just, there's so much kind of sensory input coming in that the environment feels toxic. You know, let alone not even to mention probably who knows what's floating in the air. <laughs> you know, we really kind of break it down to, to the, the thoughts of it. But I, I recall one time talking to a um, patient that had been in the ICU and they'd been in the ICU for a couple of days and I was their physician and the nurses had made this comment that, you know, he's not sleeping, he's not sleeping. And I thought, and I walked in one morning, I was post-call, so I was in there like super early, like 4.30 or something rounding and all the lights were on. I mean, the building was lit up like the 4th of July. And this is the ICU. And I sat there and I thought to myself, how in the world we expect these people to get any better? Yeah. How do we expect them to sleep when we've got sounds in every room, nurses chattering, going back and forth all night long, taking blood pressures and vital signs. And so, so really, it, it really, I really love now that the, the concept is to stabilize people and as quickly as possible, transition them to what we call a step-down room where they can close the door, shut the blinds, yes. get some darkness, and actually start the real healing process. Because the ICU is kind of like the trauma unit. Yeah, That's why it's so loud, so bright. But, you know, in the old days, we used to keep people in the ICU literally until they were almost well when they had something, you know, serious happen. Yes. Now, if you've ever had a family member go, go through something like that, it seems like we rush them out. But the rushing them out is actually how we get them better because <laughs> they will not get better in that setting. It's too toxic. Yes. And actually, on the other side, just looking at from a different lens, for a family member, they might think like, why are you pushing my family member yeah, out of the that's what they think. <laughs> it's the like my family line, member needs to be there. Yes, they, they love the one-on-one -on -one attention and all of that. But what they don't realize is that the body is under like triple the stress. And we're asking it to heal. Yeah. So that's only appropriate when we are like doing like life and death type stuff in the moment. Mm -hmm. Vent support, you know, these drips that have to be monitored every hour. When someone gets stable enough to actually go to what we call a step down unit, which is still pretty much one on one. There's usually one nurse to two patients. It's still very highly kind of focused care. It's a much better situation for the patient, for their healing and for them actually getting to a point of walking out of that hospital at some point. So that actually leads me to the really wonderful book that you have re, uh, written. I highly recommend to all of our viewers to check it out. It's called Sacred Rest. Mm -hmm. And I love the title. And I love the idea of making rest like really sacred. Like it's something that you should pursue and look forward to. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about what is the distinction between like a regular sleep versus rest? Well, that was the big thing that really, for me, that I've learned in the process of writing that book. You know, I've always kind of interchanged the word sleep and rest. Yes. You know, I'm going to go take a rest. Or I'm going to go to sleep. It, was, it kind of meant the same thing. I really didn't have an understanding of what rest was and how to even get it. Mm -hmm. And so when I started, the big thing with me that changed was that I got to a point where I burned out at one point in my life. And so when I got to that place of burnout, I felt tired all the time. And it was the kind of tired that you just couldn't, you couldn't shake, you couldn't get rid of. And I would go to sleep thinking that maybe I'm just sleep deprived. You know, I'm a physician. So I'm working these crazy hours, not always getting really great sleep, you know, being honest. 
but I thought maybe I'm just sleep deprived. So I made a real focused point of I'm going to sleep eight to nine hours every single night. And if I can do that, I should feel better, right? I should, I'm sleeping. I should wake up energized. Well, I did that for like a month and I didn't feel any better. And I was like, okay, so I'm getting sleep. So that can't be the problem. Why am I still exhausted if I'm getting more than adequate amounts of sleep? And that's what made me start thinking, maybe there's something else that's depleted in me that's not just, you know, related to needing more sleep. And yeah, and obviously, <laughs> my mindset is, let me do some blood work, make sure my thyroid's not off, my adrenals aren't off, my electrolytes aren't off, my vitamin D is not low. <laughs> so See, that, I have like the master test. <laughs> I had the master list of tests done to make sure there wasn't something hormonally wrong and everything came back perfectly normal, which I'm not sure if I was happy or sad about that because I wanted to know, I knew something was off. And the interesting thing was, these are the same things people were coming to tell me all the time, but I was just kind of like, oh, well, they're just not, you know, they're just not sleeping well. You know, they should just sleep better. I need to give them a sleep aid. <laughs> they just don't sleep well enough. And that wasn't the problem. The problem was that they weren't resting because sleep and rest are not the same thing. Sleep, um, in the, the research that I did with this, what I saw was that there are actually seven different types of rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and those seven types are the physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, sensory, creative, and social. And so sleep is just one type. It's the physical type of rest. And even physical rest has two components. It has the passive, which is the sleeping and the napping, and the active, which is stuff like yoga and stretching and, you know, leisure walking and those kind of things. So, you know, when we just focus rest as being sleep, we have taken out the six other types of rest, and you were going to feel drained if one of those other six is low. Mm. I'm glad you made that distinction, because a lot of people don't have that clarity, and that's why the pursuit does not lead to the results they might be looking for. A lot of people have this um, mindset that sleep is a luxury, you know, like rest is a luxury. What would you like to say for those people who are still in that mindset? Well, that's what much of our culture believes. You know, our culture believes <clears throat> grind it out. You know, you, you sleep when you, when you die, rest when you die, <laughs> those kind of yes. things. You know, Literally, just stay yes, at it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the culture we live in. And that's really what's built up this burned out generation we live in now. We have so many people that when you ask them, you know, do you enjoy your work? Do you enjoy your job? And they say, no. They're like, my life is, I'm tired. My, you know, my life just feels under all this pressure all the time. And really that's the result when you see rest as a luxury. Your life never feels whole. It never feels complete. You can be a high achiever producing a whole lot of great things out in the world, but you don't feel great because the life you're building doesn't allow you any space to actually taste all this goodness you're producing. I kind of relate it to the bee. You know, the bee is busy making all this honey, but won't stop long enough to taste the sweetness. And I want a life where I can stop long enough to taste how sweet I produced you know, all the different things you're putting your energy into, you want time to enjoy it, to actually get some benefit from it. Yep. So very true. So tell us, how can someone determine what type of rest they may be missing in their life? I mean, you mentioned seven types. So mm -hmm. if someone were to sit home and take an inventory of what's missing, are there any tips for them to diagnose? Absolutely. Well, I actually created a free rest assessment at restquiz.com. And that's where I usually have most of my clients start with is taking that assessment. Because, you know, when you hear seven, your brain automatically thinks, oh my God, there's seven more things I've got to do. You know? And the reality is most of us are already excelling at, at the majority of them. There's usually one or two that usually they're ones we haven't even thought about. Things like social rest or sensory or creative or maybe completely new terms you've never even heard of but that's the area where you're deficient mm -hmm. and because you're unaware that it even exists you're not even trying to get it because really that's what rest is rest is about restoring the area where you're depleted yeah sleep is definitely one of those things which is kind of an epidemic or a pandemic because it doesn't matter whether it's east or west Mm -hmm. Everyone's struggling with it and just the waking hours have extended so far beyond that people don't have time for real sleep or rest.
But mm-hmm. apart from that, what other issues you as a doctor, because you deal with it every day, that mm-hmm. our society at large are facing related to well-being and are there any tips um, that can be prevented? Yeah, I think one of the big ones is this kind of chronic chronic sensory overload that most people find themselves in. You know, we talk about sensory rest. Well, the reason you need sensory rest is because you experience ongoing sensory overload. Our electronics haven't helped with that. Mm-hmm. Some of the recent research talks about how, you know, most of us have our cell phones or, our, you know, all of our different devices that have these like notifications and buzzing and they ring and they vibrate. And what we don't realize is we, our bodies respond to those notifications. If you've ever, um, when you do, like if you're checking someone's heart rate, when a notification goes off, it's no different than a doctor's pager going off. It's like, oh, something happened. You know, let me check and see who's calling. Let me check and see who texts me. So there's like a a rise in the heart rate, an igniting of that whole stress response in the body. And does it, does it even make sense that that would be healthy to have ongoing from what, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day? We're not meant to have that type of ongoing sensory input at high levels that keeps our stress hormones kind of maxed out because all it does is it increases blood pressure, increases the likelihood of having other medical problems like heart attacks and strokes because it just keeps our senses unnecessarily overwhelmed. That does make sense, um, sensory overload. And also earlier, as you mentioned, pagers, you could only get notified that someone's looking for you. Nowadays, with the phones, you you have this compulsion of replying back mm-hmm. in the moment, which kind of adds to the distraction even more because now there there is a part of you which triggers in like, oh my God, I'm not a good person if I don't respond. Yeah, and you and you unfortunately, you know, it starts feeding over into our relationships. I, I really hate it when I'm at a restaurant with my family or with my husband. And, you know, we look over at a table and I see everybody's like, or even with my own kids, if we don't call them on it, you know, <laughs> or even call ourselves on it when we're waiting on the food to hit the table. Yes. And we're like, you know, busy checking our emails and who's doing what on Facebook. You know, we've gotten, particularly in the youth, there's a, a culture that's growing up that doesn't have a very good understanding of how to relate to other people. They've spent so much of their time with their face down in their phones that, you know, you walk into a high school and you, you look at a teen in the eye, it's almost they instantly want to find where's my phone. So I don't have to look at you, you know, where I don't have to interact with people. I don't have to learn how not to be awkward in these situations. (laughs) And so it's, it's a little scary to think that, there's this culture that's growing up with that, where they're more comfortable hiding behind screens than actually being in front of people and actually owning their space. You know, they kind of crunch down with their phones instead of claiming their space in the world, um, which I think is part of the, the whole teen youth growth process is learning how to claim your space in the world. Yep. Social anxiety is another big one. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people struggle with it. We somehow have learned to mask it and kind of deviated in different ways, but still it very much exists. Even in adults, I have noticed where it just puts you in this uncomfortable spot. Mm -hmm. You would rather hide behind an email or a phone call. Absolutely. And it's, it's growing, you know, it's people just more comfortable with that. The thing that I see that becomes really a dysfunction in how in our emotional well-being is that, you know, with social media, it's so much easier to, slander somebody or to say something hurtful or painful when you don't see how your words hit that person when they read it. You know, if I, there's, there's so many times I'm reading somebody's comments and I'm thinking, there's no way you would ever say that to someone's face because you don't want to see the tears falling after you say that. So you would keep your mouth shut, but because you can type it, walk away and not even go back to read the responses. It's very easy to lose your humanity at that point. Yep. That, that, that is so true. Uh, apart from that, I do want to also invite you to share just from your day-to-day busy schedule, some sort of time management tips. How do you carve out the rest time? Yeah, I usually like to at least once a month have a, a me period. It doesn't have to be a whole day. 
sometimes it could be an hour, sometimes it could be two hours. And that time usually is something that I, that that's kind of a treat for me. So usually for me, it's like, I'm going to go on some nature trail or do a hike somewhere, or I might be getting a massage depending on what's kind of going on in my life. I'm training for a marathon right now. So, so the nature trail would not be considered one of my me times. <laughs> that's like work now, every time I go outside to walk and run. So, um, so most of the time it has to do with things that I enjoy. I'll use it and they feel like a luxury to me when I do my me time. Now during the week, I like to schedule small moments of that. So it might be an hour to listen to an audio book that I, that I, you know, is it going to change my life? Probably not, but I want to read it. It could be, it could be a romance. It could be a mystery. It could be a thriller. You know, it's not necessarily like a nonfiction book where I, I know I'm going to be life changing and transformed, yes. but it's something I want. And I think that's something that we have to realize is that, you know, that me time, that rest looks different for different people. I get a lot of encouragement from like reading other authors, uh, particularly fiction mm -hmm. and poetry and things like that. Even movies sometimes. I'll watch a movie that's nothing about what I get inspired about, <laughs> but it awakens something inside of me. And that's really what creative rest is. It's mm -hmm. allowing other people's creative works to awaken something inside of you. And so in the work that I do now, there's a lot of innovative thoughts and creativity that's involved. So I get depleted in those areas. So I love spending time feeding myself back and building back up my own creative resources. Great. And one um, last but not the least question is, I know you are a faith-based person. And I love to bring that resting part related to faith as well, um, because you are a big advocate on bringing faith and humanity up front, whether you're professionally, personally. So mm -hmm. if you would like to speak to that. Oh, absolutely. I think faith plays a huge part in how we grow. And I think uh, one of the, my favorite saying comes from the, it's a Greek philosopher from a bazillion years ago <laughs> that says, so often we fail at helping people heal because we try to heal the mind and the body absent from the spirit when it is the spirit that actually has the most power to heal. And so for me, that is a component that has to be treated, that has to be treated no different than the mind and the body as a physician and really as any type of, of wellness practitioner, that that has to be addressed as well. I feel uh, really amazing when I hear this from someone who comes from science field, who is a doctor saying this, because a lot of doctors are still stuck with the mind body. Like we have evolved from body to a little bit of mind but still the spirit component is considered like woo-woo, like, like let's not get there because it's so controversial. And it, I personally healed my spirit and that's why my body and mind are healed. So I kind of work backwards. So I, I understand the importance of it and just wanted to make sure everyone listening to this is getting an educated perspective on it and not just experiential. Absolutely. Yep. So thank you so much, Sandra. Really appreciate you sharing your insights and uh, keep up the amazing work and helping people heal. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. Thanks, Sandra.